Coming up on this episode, author Lee Blair joins us to talk about her Dahlia Springs universe, including a brand new Christmas romance. Welcome to episode 406 of the Big Gay Fiction Podcast, the show for avid readers and passionate fans of queer romance fiction. I'm Jeff, and with me as always is my co-host and husband, Will. Welcome back, Rainbow Romance Reader. We are so glad that you could join us for another episode of the show. For those of you in the U.S., I hope you enjoyed your recent holiday weekend. It was, of course, American Thanksgiving, which, of course, I'm deeply ambivalent about. I genuinely wonder if they still teach school children the bullshit they told us (laughs) about Thanksgiving, which we all know is a complete fabrication. Nowadays, it's simply just a generic day for giving thanks, because we, of course, know the Puritans weren't awesome. There's a reason calling someone puritanical is not a compliment. Oh yeah, and if you want to know what it was really like, they wrote an entire play about it. It's called The Crucible. However, you chose to spend the holiday weekend, whether it was with friends and family, eating lots of food, or spending some time with yourself in quiet contemplation, we hope your holiday was fulfilling and (laughs) non-problematic. Jeff and I have recently been up to some interesting things. He went on a business trip to NYC and had the opportunity to experience the Broadway (laughs) while I stayed home and watched the entire 365 Days trilogy in a single 24-hour period. Let me tell you, that was an experience. You can listen to us talk about that and much more in this month's Patreon bonus episode. Speaking of thankful, we are genuinely thankful for our Patreon community. Our patrons help fund the transcription of the episodes of the podcast, making sure that the show is accessible to all readers and listeners. If you are in a position to help the podcast grow and would like more information on our bonus content and access to those episodes from the past, the present, and the future, simply head on over to patreon.com slash biggayfictionpodcast. We'd like to take just a moment to tell you about a brand new podcast that has recently premiered. It's called Queer We Are, and it's produced and hosted by friend of this podcast, Brad Shreve. You may recall that Brad hosted Queer Writers of Crime for three years, and while that show has ended, he has created this new one. In Queer We Are, Brad talks with LGBTQ plus celebrities, athletes, activists, politicians, entrepreneurs, and others who share stories of their success, challenges, and what they learned along the way. Among the show's premier week guests was drag entertainer Miss Coco Peru, who was one of our favorite performers and who had some great stories to share. You can find Queer We Are wherever you listen to podcasts or at QueerWeAre.com. And we hope you will give that show a listen. And one more quick news item. This week, there's a promotion happening for gay holiday romance novels, which are either 99 cents or free. Authors included in this promotion include Kiki Clark, Helen Juliet, R.J. Scott. There's also Kira Andrews and Lita Blake, Tara Lane, Ellie Reichart, and many more. And Jeff, you've also got a couple of stories in there, too. I do. I've got two short stories that are available for 99 cents. There's Rivals, which is a second chance romance between two former high school hockey rivals who reconnect when they are back home for the holidays. And then there's Room Service, which features an IT consultant named Martin, who is stuck working on site for a client over the holidays, and the romance that unfolds with Jose, who works at the front desk at the hotel he's staying at. You can find the complete list of books in this promotion at biggayfictionpodcast.com slash holiday. And make sure you act fast because this promotion only runs through Friday, December 2nd. I think I'm definitely going to get me some more holiday books this week. You can never have too many. Now let's talk to Lee Blair. I have become a fan of Lee's since I read Picture Perfect, the first book in her Dahlia Springs universe. Lee's going to talk to us about what got her started writing MM romances earlier this year and why she's decided to set all of them in the town of Dahlia Springs, Oregon. And, since it's the holidays, we have to talk about her latest book, 24 Dares of Christmas, which lets us experience a Dahlia Springs holiday festival. And who doesn't love a good holiday festival or soiree or whatever's going to be going on to celebrate the holidays? We also get details on how Lee is extending the fun of the 24 Dares to readers starting on December 1st. Lee, welcome to the podcast. It is so wonderful to have you here. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here and get to talk to you. I've been listening for so long and I'm excited to get to chat with you. I'm excited to talk because I fell in love with Dahlia Springs. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I mean, Picture Perfect ticked so many boxes for me. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about your 24 Dares of Christmas. 
but I want to kind of back up a little bit because you're new on the MM scene this year. And I'm curious kind of what brought you to the genre and to start writing books. Oh, yeah, I'd love to talk about that. So I started writing romance actually back in 2005, but it was male, female, hetero romance. And I back then had the goal of publication. I had joined Romance Writers of America and really wanted to be a published romance author. But it took, gosh, about a decade before I finished my first novel. I kept just hitting walls and and false starts. And I went to Scotland for the first time and was really inspired by my trip and came home and, and wrote a romance and kind of carved a niche for myself as writing contemporary Scotland set male, female, heterosexual romance. And I had an agent and I was on submission with that book. This was back in 2017. But I started to kind of realize traditional publishing wasn't necessarily where I wanted to be with my my interests. I've always been really entrepreneurial and really liked the idea of indie publishing and, and having that control and getting to experiment with different things. So I decided to kind of step away from romance back in 2019. And I was writing cozy mysteries. And I drafted my first cozy in 2019. And then kind of meanwhile, in late 2019, I had joined TikTok. And that algorithm, let me tell you, that algorithm is so good that I realized, oh, hey, I'm queer, despite thinking I'm straight for 37 years. Surprise, surprise, I am not. And so that was kind of like right before the pandemic. And I had kind of backed away a little bit from reading the male female romance and romance in general and was kind of focusing on cozy mysteries and then when the pandemic was happening my day job was really 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 stressful and i was also finishing my master's degree and i had had a bunch of friends sort of all of this is kind of culminating i'm having my own coming out the pandemic is happening and i'm finishing my master's and i have these friends telling me to watch shits creek And just over and over and over, just watch it, watch it. And they're sending me compilation videos of the David and Patrick romance, just trying to tug on my heartstrings. And so I told myself, okay, I kind of put the cozy on hold because of the pandemic stress. And when I finish defending my master's thesis, I will watch Schitt's Creek. And that's exactly what I did. That night, it was June 2020, I started watching it. And I binged the entire series in less than a week. And I immediately watched it two more times. I became obsessed. And one of my local romance writing friends had been writing Schitt's Creek fan fiction and sent me some of her work. And that was the first fandom I joined. So this was like summer 2020. I started reading fanfic, writing Schitt's Creek fanfic, and writing the David and Patrick relationship specifically. And over that next year, I posted over 600,000 words of David and Patrick wow. fanfic. Like it was my pandemic sanity. Like it just, it, Patrick's storyline with his coming out as a gay man, kind of like in his later 20s into 30s, that really clicked for me. And so I was finding my way back to romance. I was writing male, male romance And it just really, it felt comfortable. Like I was so connected with them as characters and with that coming out journey for Patrick during my own coming out journey. And it just kind of gave me the, the bug to start writing romance again. And I just felt really comfortable writing queer romance in a way that I just never quite felt comfortable writing straight romance. And so I had kind of at that time was like, okay, I'm going to publish my first cozy mystery. And I was working on that in 2021. And I said, okay, my strategic brain was like, you cannot start writing mail mail until you publish three cozy mysteries, until you have those first three out in a series, because that's a strategic thing to do. And that's a good start to that pen name. And I decided to let that plan go because I really wanted to write queer romance. And I started it, writing it in 2021, so last year. And I'm so glad that that just that kind of windy journey of romance over the years and Shit's Creek and letting myself write MM, it just 
I, I just, I found my home. I feel so comfortable writing queer romance. I love it. Had you been reading romance like prior to starting to write even the the MF romance? Yeah, I, I started, I read my first romance novel by accident back in 2005. And that was when I was like, oh, this, because I'd, I'd always written as a kid. I actually wrote like really creepy horror short stories. <laughs> my mom has been discovering these notebooks the last few months and keeps sending me photos of them of just really creepy, weird things I wrote as a little kid. So I, I knew I wanted to write and I liked writing, but I had never considered romance until I, I read that first one in 2005. And so romance was basically all I read from 2005 until probably around like 2018, 2019 was when I sort of kind of started shifting over to cozy mystery a little bit more. And then now it's back. I'm reading like all romance all the time again. Nice. Starting with Picture Perfect, which was your second book, you've decided to set all of your books for the foreseeable future in Dahlia Springs. Tell us a little bit about this town and how you went about creating this place for all of your stories to occur in. So basically, Dahlia Springs is my personal utopia. <laughs> like it is just the town that I want to live in. I live in a small town in Western Oregon, but it's not exactly, how do I say this, a beacon of progressive values that I align with. So I like a lot about small towns, but I struggle with feeling really comfortable in the town I live in as someone who identifies as a queer person. There's just kind of some of those, it just doesn't always feel quite as comfortable. And so I just thought, gosh, if I could write a place where that is okay, like you, people do feel comfortable in that town, but then it still has all the like charms of living in a small town in Oregon. And as a reader, I really enjoy small towns. It's one of the things that drew me to writing cozy mysteries is getting to know and, and reading cozy is like getting to know the side characters, quirky people, like fun small town festivals. And I really wanted to create a town where readers could get to know side characters who would appear book after book and have these the sort of story of the town grow across series. And kind of also as a reader, I really love crossover and connected series. That's just one of the things I absolutely adore is when an author has a series and then in a world and kind of sets up another series where characters pop back and forth. And so when I was thinking about writing my own books, I thought, oh, that's something like if I love reading that, I should probably write it too. And I think Schitt's Creek was also a little bit of an influence because Schitt's Creek, you know, there's... Schitt's Creek has its own problems, but it's the problems are not based in homophobia, racism, sexism. It's it's a town where people are accepted, or if they're judged, it's more like personality based <laughs> traits. And I wanted to kind of bring that spirit to Dahlia Springs a little bit too. That it is a really inclusive and welcoming space, and kind of in terms of like this the specifics about it. I wanted it to be a location where it's close enough where you could visit Portland easily. So I envision it being about an hour from Portland so that I could bring Portland in as a location and a setting for some of the books, but then far enough where it really is kind of a rural environment. And so I kind of just decided, well, what if there was a bunch of people in Portland who liked the progressive nature of the town, but really wanted that small town feel? And so they founded a town kind of between Portland and the coast. And so that was kind of the idea behind Dahlia Springs. And I've lived in a small town for about 17 years now. So there's lots of quirky stuff I've seen over the years that is fun to bring into the books. So the first book that is in Dahlia Springs, of course, is Picture Perfect. And that sets up the first of the Tap That Brewery series. One of our members of our Patreon community, Regency Fan 93, wanted to know if you're a brewer. Because like we see coffee shops and we see bookstores and all of these things, you know, frequently for romances, but the brewery, not so much. So how did you choose a brewery? And is there brewing in your background somewhere? I love that question so much. 
I wish I had that skill set of being a brewer. And sometimes I think about getting into homebrew. I would really like that, to do that, but I do not have that skill set, unfortunately. But it it sort of came about, I would say, I think fall of 2021, I was finishing the draft of my debut novella, which is set in Portland. It's called Just Watch Me and it's completely standalone. And at that time I knew like I wanted to create a series and have a connecting hook that was kind of location-based. And as a reader, I really like groups of friends who work together and have those dynamics. And so I just been kind of trying to brainstorm what are some options I could have friend groups as a, a series connector, coworkers, families, just different things. And I was, as I was brainstorming kind of those possible connection ideas, I was sort of initially thinking about maybe a food truck pod in Portland or some sort of market, like a night market where people, different people had stalls. And so there could be like the dynamics of working in a place like that. But I don't know, then I, I just really wanted that small town vibe. So I think it really just kind of came down to making a list of some different business types. And I don't remember exactly what sparked it, but I've had the conversation with so many local friends and coworkers about how we wish more small towns in our area of Oregon have breweries. Like it would be so nice if there were more small town breweries. And so I thought, oh, well, if I can't have one in real life where I live, why not just make one in the fictional world I spend so much time in? And then the puns started writing themselves <laughs> and, and Googling beer puns. And so I was like, yep, yeah, they're going to work in a brewery. There's so much <laughs> pun potential. <laughs> and for myself, I have to know because the meat cute in Picture Perfect just struck me as just wonderful because you've got <laughs> these two guys who meet in a paper store, like a stationary <laughs> store with papers and pens and all this stuff. How on earth did you land it at a paper store? Because I love a good paper store <laughs> myself. I Part of it is there is a paper store in Portland in the Pearl District that I absolutely love. And I think I was picturing them there. And it's sort of near Powell's books, which is kind of part of the the story of of possibly hitting, you know, the guys visiting Powell's while they were there. And I just really like paper products and pens and all of that stuff. So I, I think... I, don't, I I really write what I want to read. Like my writing is a very selfish endeavor. And I think I just thought, well, if I'm in a paper store buying pens, I want to have my own meet cute. So maybe I'll just write them having one there instead. <laughs> I was totally delighted by it. I mean, because it, it's in that first chapter, like a meet cute it's supposed to be, of course, I'm just like this paper store meet cute. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tell everybody so about adorable. Tap That if they don't know about this series. And, you know, the first book, the second one's recently come out. Tell folks about these brewery guys. Oh, I'd love to. So the series follows a group of four best friends who open a brewery together. So two of the guys, Austin and Ty or Tyler, they are cousins and grew up in Dahlia Springs and they roomed together in college. And the two guys rooming next to them, Ethan and Dom, are the other two. So the four of them become best friends. And the series opens after they've already opened the brewery. So I, I can't remember exactly, but I think it's maybe been open for a year or so, maybe a little less. And I wanted to create it at a time where the brewery exists, but there's still some growing pains that I could write about in the series. But then also it's early enough in the brewery that there's a lot of opportunity for growth, both in the series, as well as just in the Dahlia Springs world, as I write other series set there. And so each of the guys are equal co-owners, and they have like a different area that they manage. So Austin's a brewer. He's been doing homebrew for the guys since college. Ethan manages like the tap room and is the bartender. So he's kind of the face of the brewery in that way. Ty does marketing and sales. And then Dom is like the finance and operations guy and totally thinks he's the boss of all of them. And one of the elements I really wanted to add to the brewery and to their friendship is that they all live together. 
So I wrote it in a way that they each sort of contributed something to the creation of the brewery. And Dom had sold his house that he had in the Portland area and bought a fixer upper in Dahlia Springs. And the other guys live with him rent free as a way to kind of keep their expenses down while they're trying to get the brewery off the ground. And that provides a lot of fun opportunities, both to have them interacting at work, but then to like have them interacting at home. And it's been fun to think about the silly things that they would do as co-workers and friends like they have a room in Dom's house it's dedicated as a meeting room and they each have like a matching armchair so it sort of feels like four kings at like a council meeting with their own parts of the room and there's a um how do I say this politely, like a, a double-sided hot pink silicone toy that they use as a talking <laughs> stick when things get too heated in debates, when they have their like weekly meetings. And uh, so it's been fun to show their shenanigans that they have as friends and coworkers over the course of the series. And each of the guys will get a book there's a lot of texting in the books so far. Like you said, I have have two out. That's Ethan and Austin's books. Now I'm writing Ty's book. And then there'll be two more. I've introduced Ty's brother and he will get a book. And then Dom will also get a book. So there's planned five in the series. Oh, five. There's only four running the brewery, but now we've got the brother on the scene. Yep. So we get five. That's cool. Yeah. He's he's in each book. He's going to be a little more. So as I'm writing Ty's book right now, he's going to be in that one a little bit more so we get to know him before his book. And then also you've already started to expand Dahlia Springs because earlier this month you put out 24 Dares of Christmas. And if ever there was a Hallmark Channel sounding title <laughs> to a book, that would be one right there. Yay! <laughs> we meet Reed and we meet Warren in this book. And Reed, ah, I just love this. He's come because he's between jobs and he kind of needs a life reset, although he doesn't realize it when he gets there necessarily. He's dog sitting for his aunt who has resurrected his childhood thing of an advent calendar that's full of dares that I just thought was a tremendous idea. But tell people a little bit more about what they're going to get with Reed and Warren. Yeah. So <laughs> Reed and Warren, this is basically like my Hallmark Christmas fantasy. I, just, I love them so much. I really wish I could go through these dares like Reed did. So he's a little little bit of a Grinch, or he thinks he is, until Warren meets him and proves him wrong. And so, like you said, Reed is there dog sitting for his aunt, and Warren is the tenant of Reed's aunt and lives in a little like studio building in the backyard. And so Reed completely expected to come for the month of December and dog sit be alone for Christmas, all of his family's out of town, and just kind of have this reset before he moves to Seattle in the new year for a new job. But with those dares that his aunt leaves him, you know, she's got other plans. And so with the, the dares, she's left him 24 things to basically get him out of the house and to help him find his Christmas spirit. And fortunately, Warren is basically a Christmas elf, and he just wants nothing more than to help Reed have a great Christmas and to do these dares with him. And so their dares are kind of a mix of things like having Reed attend festival events, because of course, it's small town Christmas time, and there has to be a festival with adorable mm -hmm. things. <laughs> it's very hallmarky. Some are like more philosophical dares, and then just things having just enjoying things at home, like Christmas movie marathons, or recreating of beloved family dish or going ice skating. And so there's basically a lot of opportunities to shove Christmas in his face like a snowball and just have him and Warren spending so much time together doing really sweet, smoopy things. I like how you got him into having to cover the festival. Because besides the dares, you just had to just keep thrusting him into it <laughs> to get him to do that. <laughs> It was fun to get to torture him a little bit. And part of that, I think, comes from my background. My day job is communications and social media and marketing. And so that felt like a natural place to get Reed involved because it could very easily be an overwhelming job for someone to try to cover on social media all of these events. And it felt like a good fit for Reed to do it. And then 
it just forces him out of the house and he has to do all this stuff he doesn't want to until he starts liking it. And then, you know, oh, it would be so much fun. I wish I could experience it. <laughs> it seems like a lot of fun to come up with the dares. Yes. And as you and I are talking, I'm about 60% done with the book. But we don't get the dare for every single day mm -hmm. of the 24, because then you would have a really big book, too, if, yes. you, had to <laughs> if you had to cover 24 days in the book. Are there dares that you came up with that got left on the cutting room floor that you're like, oh, I wish I got that one in the book? Yes, there are. It was a kind of methodical process. I I brainstormed a whole bunch of of basically Christmas activities or holiday or festive activities. And honestly, it was an opportunity to put my hundreds of hours watching Hallmark Christmas movies to good use. So now I can officially call all of that research because I just was thinking, okay, by osmosis and just watching all these movies, I have somehow absorbed a million different adorable holiday and Christmas moments. And so I made a list and then I was sort of like narrowing it down of what would make sense and what would be really fun to show in a scene versus what would work to just sort of casually mention in the off page days between scenes of, oh, they did this thing. I, it wasn't necessarily something I needed to show, but there were quite a few things that I had brainstormed that I thought would be fun, but didn't quite make it in. So I'm, I'll have to put it in a, a different Christmas book, but things like Christmas caroling or making ugly Christmas sweaters or volunteering at a food pantry, or I thought doing something with snow. I think a lot of people assume it snows a lot in Oregon, especially in this part of Oregon, but it doesn't. You get an inch and it shuts down. It's it's pandemonium. People don't know how to handle it. And to have them interact with snow, like if I had a dare of making a snow person, either I would have to have a freak snowstorm, which would kind of throw off parts of the book, or I would have to have them drive to Mount Hood, which would be a couple hour drive from where it's at. And I really kind of wanted them to have a fun snow day. And I was thinking of making that an add-on to one of the days when they go to Portland for a day, but it just didn't quite work out. So that was something that hit the cutting room floor and I will have to add snow into a different book. The snow can lead to forced proximity and yes. being snowed in and who doesn't love that kind of book as well? <laughs> exactly. And I'm already starting to think of next year's Christmas book. So I think that there will have to be some, some snowed in goodness. Excellent. Now, you're also planning to do an advent calendar for your readers starting on December 1st. What can you tease us a little bit about that? Oh, yes. So basically, I really, I mean, if this hasn't come through yet, I wish I could live in Dahlia Springs. And I really wished that someone would give me an advent of dares. I just, I thought that would, that would be so much fun. And so I figured, why let it just sit in the book? I could do something like that. It would be easy to put together emails. And so starting on December 1st, anyone who signs up to participate, I will email out a dare each day. And there'll be pretty easy things to do, something that someone can maybe post about on social media so we can see each other doing dares and kind of engage and have fun. So people can sign up at I have a link or an email sign up at leeblairbooks.com forward slash 24 dares. Or if you find me on social media at Lee Blair Books, I've got a link directly to it in my bio. And then if anyone signs up after December 1st, you'll start getting the email the next day. And then in each email, it'll have a list of the dares from the previous day. So if anyone doesn't sign up right away, you can still kind of catch up and play along. But I don't know. I just kind of thought... I really like Advents and I thought it would be just a different kind of fun, interactive way to bring some holiday cheer. And there does seem to be an Advent calendar for everything yes. <laughs> these days. I was listening to it was a recent episode of Smart Podcast Trashy Books, and they were talking about like literally anything you would want has an Advent calendar. And now I see Advent calendars everywhere I go just to help prove the point. <laughs> It's so true. Last year, I bought a wine advent calendar, 
but I still have like half the bottles because that was just, it was too much for me to keep up with. I really want to get, there's some cheese ones at Costco that are so tempting, but like I, that's a lot, a lot of cheese. I did buy a jam and jelly one. Is it, but why am I spacing on the brand, the name Bone My Mom? I'm that kind. might be it because Sarah and Amanda on Smart Podcast were talking about a jam advent calendar yes. that they both really loved. I'm excited. A little, little tiny. And then the the person in me who likes to collect jars and boxes, it's like, oh, I'm about to have 24 tiny little jars I can use for things. <laughs> so I'm excited about that. I'm, I'm already planning on like trying to make crumpets and scones and different stuff to go with it. So that's, that's my advent. I also did buy a chocolate advent because I mean, I have that's to a have classic. Classic. Yeah. I've, who wouldn't want that? So I'm going to have jam in the mornings and chocolate in the evenings. And I, I might stop there. We'll see. We still have a couple weeks. So we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> what was your favorite scene to write in 24 Dares? Ooh. So I think if you asked me that about any other book, I would struggle to answer. But with this book, oh my gosh, it's so easy. So I really wanted Reed to be on the Grinch side and Warren to be like super Christmassy. And part of the reason why Reed doesn't love Christmas is because he doesn't feel super close with his family. There's a big age gap between him and his siblings. And with his whole family being out of town for Christmas, Warren wants to like step in and make sure that Reed has a good Christmas. So Warren's family, there's four children, all close in age. And then his two parents, they all love Christmas and they have some really intense traditions. And so one of them is that they all get together at the parents' house a few weeks before Christmas to decorate the house. And they draw chores, decorating chores. And so one person is assigned to like set out the Christmas village, which is an intense one because the mom really has, you know, very particular ways that she likes it or to put the lights on the tree or decorate the windows. And then after that, there's a competition that the parents put together for the four kids to compete over who gets to hang the creepy angel on top of the tree that's like missing an eye and has cigarette burns. And it just is a gnarly looking angel. And so I wrote part of the scene from Warren's perspective and part from Reed's perspective about Reed joining the family for that. And I had so much fun writing like Warren bringing someone into the family who reacts really positively to all the festive cheer and then Reed feeling really welcome. And then the competitiveness with all the kids teasing each other. Oh, I had so much fun writing that. They did like an elimination style round robin minute to win it set of games that are just absurd. But oh, I had so much fun writing that. I'm so glad you picked that one because I adore that scene and the bonkersness oh. <laughs> that goes on with that. Thank you. Where did you get those some of those games? Because some of them are just insane, like the <laughs> like putting the the red nose on the on Rudolph coloring pages. I mean, I <laughs> it was a, a mix of me googling like Christmas party games and then thinking. And how can I make this bonkers? <laughs> what can I do to just make it totally wild and competitive and also brief that it could be something where there could be multiple rounds. So it was a mix of Googling and then just my wild, wild Christmas brain, I guess. <laughs> I can only imagine what you might throw if you were throwing your own <laughs> festival for Christmas. Oh, that would Being be the what's dream. inside this book. <laughs> Oh, I would love that so much. The power I would your, wield. What are some of your favorite holiday traditions? I would say spending Christmas Eve and Christmas Day with my parents. It's been the three of us for a lot of years. And so just getting that quality time with them is really nice. We watch National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation every year on Christmas Eve. And so, like a really fun tradition I like with them is ever since I was a little kid, they give me a set of pajamas on Christmas Eve to open and wear that night and then wear, you know, the next morning. And they still do this. I'm 40 and I still get a pair of pajamas every year. And one of my best friends has taken that tradition and has been doing it with her kids. And so that's been really sweet to see those photos. And kind of generally, 
I really just like the cooking and the baking. And I've been doing most of the holiday cooking and baking since high school. And I, I live alone. And so I don't get an opportunity to cook for other people that often. And so it's really fun to have like the, the pace and the pressure of trying to cook a lot of things for multiple people is kind of a tradition I really like. And then the kind of solo, honestly, it's sitting on my couch watching Hallmark Christmas movies and starting new crochet projects that I may or may not finish. <laughs> that's that's sort of the tradition phase I am in at present is I bought a bunch of yarn last weekend and a bunch of patterns off Etsy and my DVR is loaded with Hallmark movies. So let's do it. <laughs> nice. Along with those traditions, what's a favorite gift that you got as a child that kind of still stands out to you to this day? <laughs> this is actually in the dedication for 24 Dares. I dedicated that to my parents. And when, when I was growing up, I think my mom probably did most of the shopping for me. And every year my dad would give me a special gift, like something that he picked out. And when I was a kid, there was, I, I really loved original Nintendo. And there was a thing called the Game Genie back then that you could like attach to a cartridge and it came with a book of like cheat codes for a whole bunch of games. And I think this was around the time that the Disney Aladdin movie, like there were like the, old cartoon movie came out. And so that's what I had asked for for Christmas. And I opened the special gift from from my dad. And it was in my mom's handwriting. She drew like the genie from Aladdin in green. And they joked that, well, here's your green genie that you wanted. And me just being a really like super polite only child kid was like, oh, that's so nice. Thank you so much and then like they let me think that that was my gift for a while and then they gave me the game genie but I just love that level of trolling of, of a kid that's just I think really instilled my sense of humor and then related to that one of my mom's favorite movies is Night at the Roxbury she loves Will Ferrell we all love Will Ferrell in my family and Every year for quite a while, my mom would give me like a, a raunchier gift from Doug and Steve Wutabi, the characters in the movie. And so every year I get to like open something just ridiculous. And so those are kind of some of my favorite memories of basically just my parents teasing me relentlessly. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we talked about this being your debut author year. It was also your debut to go to GRL. How was that experience? Oh my gosh, it was amazing. I loved it, especially now that I'm I've recovered from the COVID I got from there. It's it's a little easier to just without the brain fog to just think over how amazing it was. I started attending author and reader events back in 2005 when I had originally joined Romance Writers of America. And while I was a member of that organization, I had attended numerous national conferences. So over the years, I'd sort of built up in my head, okay, when I'm published and finally can attend my own signings, like these are swag ideas I have. And I'm just really excited to get to talk to readers. And so I've had like 17 years of that emotional buildup of just having that experience of attending that sort of event as an author, a published author, not just a reader or an unpublished author. And it was incredible. It just is such a wild experience to have people talk to me about my books face to face in a way where I can read their body language. And it's just a, a different kind of validation that it, it hits differently than reading reviews online when you can get the animation of talking to someone about it. And it it was also just incredible as a reader. I'm such a voracious reader of queer romance and getting to meet so many of my favorite authors and meet online friends in real life. And as an author kind of in my debut year, who's only been part of the MM community for about a year and a half, I've been sort of trying to find my place in the community because I was involved in romance for so many years. But this is a, a different, closer knit, tighter niche of authors. And so GRL, I think just having that in-person element really helped me feel more comfortable in the space. And then as someone who identifies as queer, being at an event with several hundred people who are either queer 
or allies. It just, I just felt so comfortable and at home. And it just, it was incredibly validating of, yes, I have found the corner of romance where I feel super comfortable and super welcome as a reader and a writer. And yes, it was everything I could have hoped for and more. Oh, that's awesome. It is a good feeling of tribe when you're there. Yeah. For sure. And I love seeing your photos from there, from the weekend of like you at your author table and some of the other stuff you post is like, she's having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> I really was. I need to post. I was going around like I, I was halfway through the event and I was seeing some other people posting selfies with with author friends. I was like, oh, dang it. I haven't been taking pictures with people. So then the last two days I'm running around trying like, hey, can, can, can I get a picture with you? So I still need to post those. But it was, it's interesting to try to navigate that being an uber fan of so many authors and then also trying to be a peer as a newly published author and trying to like navigate, hi, can we be friends? Also, I'm a huge fan of you and I'm trying not to be creepy because I, I'm also, you know, like that, that was an interesting thing to try to navigate in person, but I really, really, really liked it. One of the things I love so much about the couple of Dahlia Springs books I've read so far is the low angst approach. I don't mind a good angsty book sometimes. <sighs> But certainly over the last couple of years, you know, the softer and low angst it is, the better, because I want that kind of book. What is it that appealed to you so much about low angst as both a reader and an author? I would say one of the things that I struggled with over all the years that I've been writing romance and trying to work toward publication has been the dark moments, the breakups, the high conflict between characters in a romantic relationship. And I think ever since I had joined Romance Writers of America back in 2005, and I started attending regular workshops and classes, I was taught that romances have specific beats, that there should be these dark moments and possibly misunderstandings or breakups. And it wasn't really until last year, I guess, that I sort of clocked for myself, oh, I've really internalized over the years that romances, in order to be like air quotes, good and memorable, have to have a certain level of heavy emotion and angst. And that isn't always the case. Like there's room for all levels of emotion and angst to be good romances. And it wasn't until... I got into Shit's Creek in that fandom, since that was my first fandom and my first experience with fan fiction, I started noticing people would use the word angst a lot. Like, hey, I'm looking for high angst recommendations. I'm looking for low angst and fluffy recommendations. And so that got me really kind of thinking about what angst is and what my preferences are as a reader. It took me quite a while to really realize that authors can and are putting out low angst books successfully. They're calling it low angst and that readers are asking for low angst in like, you know, Facebook rec groups. Hey, I'm looking for low angst recommendations. And I really didn't realize that that was a thing because I'd so internalized this expectation of angst in characters and that that, that needs to be there for the romance to be satisfying. And I still carry, now that I realize that and I'm like moved to low angst, I carry a lot of guilt because I would critique for friends over the years and and sort of push more conflict, more tension, where's the stakes? And one of my friends is a low angst writer too. And, and I feel bad because now that I realize that that's what she writes, I was recommending to her like, hey, where are the stakes? Where, you know, where's, this needs more oomph. It needs more heaviness, but it doesn't. And so Having this experience has even changed how I give feedback to other authors because it, it has me rethinking that there can be many ways to approach telling a romance. So I've really realized that low angst is my comfort zone as a reader and an author. And I think part of it, this sort of realization is connected to, I really love Clifton strengths, like the psychometric test. And my top two strengths are positivity and empathy, mm -hmm. which for me means I work really, really hard to be happy all the time. And so the media I consume can really tank my mood quickly and have really lasting effects on my mood. And 
I think that's one of the reasons I had sort of unconsciously moved away from reading romances toward cozy mysteries is cozies. The tone of those is so much lighter and fun and silly and not all romances I'd been reading were like that because I didn't have that like articulated language to be able to seek out the lighter end of the spectrum. And Mm -hmm. so kind of like when I read, I become the characters. I think that's how my empathy works. I'm not in a room watching it happening, I become them. So the higher the angst, the deeper the drop is for me. And oftentimes the HEA can't bring me out of that enough. So with that, with the low angst, it just kind of helps me sort of moderate my reactions to books because I can, I, I just internalize them so much. And since I spend so much of my time either reading or living in the world I write, I found that kind of living in the lighter side of the spectrum has just been really good for my mental health overall, I think. So I like really what you did in Picture Perfect. And I think I talked about this in my review because there are definitely stakes for Austin and Caleb. They're both trying to make their businesses, bring them to the next level. For Caleb, it's about getting established in Dahlia Springs and hopefully being able to stay there. And for both of them, they both have issues a little bit around opening up their heart to like getting into the relationship. So there's stakes, but they talk. They talk a lot. Nothing festers. And to me, that's like the perfect low angst because I do want there to be stakes to help propel the story and have all the external stuff that needs to go on. But at the end of the day, they're chatting. So even their dark moment isn't the darkest of dark (laughs) because we're going to talk about it and move on. Yeah, I that's what I really like as a reader too. And I, I think I've just really tried to internalize the philosophy of of write what I want to read because I'll have more fun writing the books. And I think my flavor of preference for low angst is that high communication. And even if there is, you know, they still have trauma in their lives that they're still working through. They have goals. Those might be in opposition from each other. There still is conflict and tension. A lot of it is external or them just trying to get over their own mental and emotional hurdles. But the dips in my roller coaster aren't quite as much of a drop. Or if there is a dark moment, it's either resolved quickly or they just ask for some time to to just like think about something before they act like before they react harshly and like, Hey, I just need a minute. We're okay. We're going to talk about this, but I need a minute because I think high communication is something I really value. And I think for me, cause I know a lot of, a lot of readers like reading about the messiness of communication because it feels very realistic because humans are messy. And I totally get that and agree with that. And I think for me, part of the fantasy of romance and the romance I like to write and read the be- the most is when they communicate with each other. That's something I struggle to do. I struggle with communication and relationships in some ways, especially if it's expressing my own pain, my discomfort, if I'm upset about something. And so when I can read or write about characters who can manage that, that is part of the fantasy for me. Like, oh, they can, they can do that. Maybe I can do it too. But that, that feels like warm and fuzzy and fulfilling to me in in a low angst way when they have that communication. And you're kind of going all in on low angst. You're even starting a podcast called the low angst (laughs) library, which we are so excited about. Tell our listeners what they're going to find on your show. Oh, I'd love to. I I really am going all in on low angst. Like once I find a thing, oh boy. (laughs) So each episode of the podcast will have an interview with a different author who writes low angst queer romance. And eventually I think I'll expand to interviewing other people in the industry, like maybe reviewers, readers who really like low angst, or maybe editors or cover designers who kind of work in this niche. But so far I've interviewed authors and so far they've been authors of male, male romance, because that is more of who I know since that's what I'm currently writing. But I really want to talk to authors who write main characters like all over the LGBTQIA2S plus 
umbrella. So I'm hoping that listeners will suggest other authors because I really want to have a lot of diverse representation on the podcast and a lot of representation of queerness. And so, yeah, each episode will come out every two weeks is the plan and an interview with an author each time and just talking about low angst and what that means, because I'm finding sort of like if you ask someone what is spicy or steamy and those definitions are going to be all over the place. It's like that with low angst. People have really different definitions, I'm finding. And that's been really fun to talk to different people about that and just kind of get to know their why they write and what they write and what inspires them. And it's been fun so far. Who are some of your first guests that you can maybe let people know who they'll find as you debut? Oh, yeah. So we've got AJ Truman and KM Newhold, Isla Olson, Charlie Novak, Jacqueline Quinn, and Ariella Zoel are the first batch of episodes. Oh, fantastic. Some good, good authors in there. Yes. Um, some of my favorites. It was honestly yeah. selfish. Like, ooh, who are some of the people who really inspired me? And can I talk to them, especially since five of them were attending GRL? And I thought, oh, maybe if I can do these interviews before GRL, I'll get to talk to them a little bit and then I'll feel a little less awkward about approaching them in person at the conference. Speaking of recommendations and what you like to read, what are some recs that you would give to our audience of books they should be picking up? Oh, yeah. So there's, I've been reading a lot of amazing, amazing books lately. And a couple that come to mind. So on the non holiday side of this, of things, I was, I, I met Zoe Lee at GRL, and she was great. And so when I came home, I read her Fakers series. Books are concocted and fabricated, and they're low angst, super funny Hollywood set with celebrities. And those were just really, really, really fun reads. And I recommend those. And I just finished reading Charlie Novak's newest. So this is a holiday wreck, Up to Snow Good. I love puns Gosh, so much. Pun. It's so good. And it's a low angst, super sweet and sexy set in France. Basically, Charlie could write my shopping list and I would rate it five stars. I love She's everything brilliant. she writes. She does the low angst and she does holiday really well too. Yes. Oh my gosh. This book is so good. I mean, I was really fortunate to get to meet her at GRL as well. So those were kind of a non-holiday and a holiday wreck that came to mind. Fantastic. Now, you've already mentioned five books in the Tap That series on the way. So there's four to come with the first one already out. What else can you share about like what 2023 holds for the Dahlia Springs universe? Oh, yeah. So, yep, got three more of the Tap That books coming out. I think the next one is Ty's book will come out probably March of 2023 is what I'm thinking. And then hopefully Seth and Dom's books will come close-ish after that. And I am considering expanding a novella set in the town. So I was part of a group promotion in June and I wrote a story about Dave who runs the coffee shop, A Whole Latte Love. Did I mention I love puns? <laughs> so I released that in June and that one had a, that promo had a word count limit. And there's more that I want to tell about that story because it's one of my, it's set in pride. It's got dr amateur drag, but it's got one of my favorite tropes, which is when two people know each other online anonymously and know each other in person, but don't know that it's the same person. And I would love to expand that into a full novel and tell more of their story. So I'm thinking about doing that. And then I'm already planning next year's Christmas books. I'm thinking about two of them. And also the next once the Tap That Brewery series wraps up, I want to write another series in the town probably centered on the Dahlia Farm and a few brothers who are part of the family that run that. So I'm I'm thinking that that might be coming later 2023. Nice. Any possibility that Mabel ever gets a story? I adore her so, <laughs> so much. Oh, I've I only seen her in two books that. so far, but she is such a strong supporting character. I love her. She just is no nonsense. And I just really respect the work that the Chamber of Commerce folks do in small towns. I never thought about that, but I am going to have to add that to my list of ideas. That would be fun to write a little Mabel story. 
Yeah. Ooh, Even if it's not you. a whole book, if it's like a, a, a little Dahlia Springs extra or something, just to see who she is behind her Chamber of Commerce work. Yeah. And I I have plans to write sapphic stories set in the universe as well, because I have a lesbian bar in the town called The Lucky Tongue. And I thought, oh, it'd be really fun to <laughs> write a series, Women Loving Women series set around there. And that could be fun to work Mabel into that series, maybe. I'll have to give that some thought. Thanks for the idea. Absolutely. Like Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> So how can people keep up with you online to know everything that's going on with you, your books, Dahlia Springs, the podcast, everything else? You can find me. My website is leeblairbooks.com. And at Lee Blair Books is where to find me on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. I also have a Facebook reader group called Lee Blair's Buddies. And on there... Every Thursday, I post a random group text excerpt from the Tap That Brewery guys because oh that's part of each book. <laughs> and it's just complete random, just randomness. It's mostly Ty and his shenanigans, but that, those are really fun to post that. And then for the podcast, it's called The Low Angst Library. And you can subscribe on any of the major podcast platforms or visit lowangstlibrary.com or at lowangstlibrary on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. We will link to all of that stuff in our show notes. Lee, thank you so much for coming to the show. I loved this conversation. and I cannot wait to read more from Dahlia Springs and to check out the podcast. Thank you so much. This has been an absolute pleasure to talk with you. And I am just so happy to be here. I love this podcast. Thanks, Jeff. This episode's transcript has been brought to you by our community on Patreon. If you'd like to read the conversation for yourself, simply head on over to the show notes page for this episode at BigGayFictionPodcast.com. The show notes page has links to everything that we've talked about in this episode. Thanks so much to Lee for talking to us about Dahlia Springs. I look forward to visiting that town again in the coming year. And I'm also signed up for the 24 Dares and cannot wait to play along. All right. I think that'll do it for now. Coming up next in episode 407, it's time for another episode full of reviews. We've got loads to tell you about, including several holiday romances to add to your seasonal TBR. On behalf of Jeff and myself, we want to thank you so much for listening, and we hope that you'll join us again soon for more discussions about the kinds of stories we all love, the big gay fiction kind. Until then, keep turning those pages and keep reading. Big Gay Fiction Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more shows you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Original theme music by Daryl Banner. 